Welcome to Bullion Max, the podcast. I'm Mark Allen, along with Sean Reynolds, the customer service manager for Bullion Max. We're going to take a look at a new book and talk about a podcast. Uh, the book is called Bubble 3.0, and the author is David Hay. David, welcome to Bullion Max. Thank you, Mark. It's a pleasure to be here with you and Sean. I'm really curious. What is your background in the financial area? Well, I've only been doing this for about 43 years. So my career started many presidents ago, back when Jimmy Carter was putting solar panels on the White House. So that's how ancient I am. <laughs> so you, uh, let's see, I'm doing some math there. You must have started at the age of three. <laughs> You're right. Roughly, roughly. Yeah, roughly, right? I was a little yeah. bit of a child prodigy now, I wish. But God, six so grandchildren. During that time, uh, during these what, 40 years or so, what did you, what have you done in the financial area? So I started out as your kind of garden variety, smiling, dialing stock broker with what was Dean Witter back then. And uh, after about 13 years of Dean Witter migrated to Smith Barney, where we actually were able to set up a portfolio management program. So graduate from a broker to a, an actual money manager, fee-based money manager. And then in 2002, uh, went from there to, uh, and ironically, both of those firms are now part of Morgan Stanley, but mm -hmm. I went out on my own, basically bought a majority stake in an independent RIA in 2002, which is now Evergreen GovCal. So the GovCal in there, I don't know if you're familiar with that great research firm that has almost every major money manager as a client, and we're very privileged to have them as partners. So that's a little bit of a quick run through of my career. Well, let's take a look at um, October. 2022. Are we in a financial mess right now or are we okay? Oh, absolutely. We're in a financial mess. And that's really, so the book that you were talking about, Bubble 3.0, I, I wrote it really to document what I believe was the greatest bubble ever seen in recorded human history, going back into thousands and thousands of years. And I think that the central banks were instrumental in creating that. And I think one of the ways they did that, I mean, they did it two ways, one by interest rates at you know, multi-thousand year lows. And of course, in much of the world, developed world, negative interest rates, one of the craziest things ever created. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that naturally creates bubbles in asset prices. And then, of course, we had, you know, this full-blown <coughs> MMP, modern monetary theory blushing. And it, uh, I mean, it, just, uh, it was a combination of just extremely lax, loose, incontinent monetary policies joining with equally incontinent fiscal policies. That was what was different over the last couple of years. And that created what I think was peak insanity, insanity in the financial markets uh, in the first half of the last year. And there were so many examples, which I document in my book, but you know, Dogecoin being kind of the, the poster child for the absolute speculative hysteria that got up to an $88 billion market cap, but it had lots of company. There were so many examples of you know, speculation just totally run amok last year. Uh, right now, prices are going up, everything but real estate. Real estate is finally coming down, at least here in California it is, because I, I monitor where I live. Um, uh, rents are skyrocketing throughout the country. Pricing, uh, the price of bread would make somebody who was living 30 years ago have a heart attack. I mean, grocery prices are outrageous. Um, inflation is pushing double digits. What can we as an individual do? And are precious metals something that they should look into, in your opinion? Well, absolutely. And they play a prominent role in my solution set in my book. You know, I actually do a little bit of a riff on, you know, what would Rhett Butler from Gone with the Wind, you know, the Clark Gable <laughs> character, what would he do? Because he famously, at least in the book, uh, you know, made a fortune when the Confederacy collapsed and their, their currency became worthless mm -hmm. and gold played a, a critical role. And I think it does again. You know, obviously, right now we've got a situation where what Michael Cow, the urban cowboy, calls the wrecking ball dollar has you know, wreaked havoc on so many different things, including gold. Because if you look at other currencies, gold is doing fine. It's having an up year against most of the major other currencies. And then if you happen to be in Turkey, which is getting hyperinflation, uh, it's doing fabulously well. But I, I think one of the realities of gold is it's not 
the greatest inflation hedge. It's a very good hedge against currency debasement. Mm. And, you know, because we've seen a lot of inflation the last couple of years and gold's actually below where it was in 2020. And I think you can make a rational argument back in 2020 from kind of the spring to the fall of 2020, gold and silver went ballistic and the mining stocks went absolutely through the roof. Mm-hmm. And, you know, fortunately, we, we, we did take substantial profits because that's, you know, that's the trouble, I think, with precious metals is they have these huge moves. And when they have these huge up moves, there's a tendency to buy more of them. You know, people love to see, you know, quick dollars, quick profits. And mm-hmm. you know, that's not the way to play them. You got to take money off the table when they have their big run ups and then be in a position to buy them when they're out of favor, which they are right now. And I, I think you're seeing some very bullish developments in terms of negative sentiment, you know, being at just extremely low levels. We're seeing the largest outflows from gold funds that we have seen since 2014, which was a good time to be in precious metals. So I think it's a really good setup, but I think the first thing that has to happen is for the wrecking ball dollar to actually start going down in price. It's about 35% overvalued on a purchasing power parity PPP basis. So it's, uh, you know, that, that's that been the, the real culprit, the real problem for precious metals this year. You just said that um, gold is a currency. Is gold still a currency? Well, I believe it is. I believe it's probably the ultimate currency. You know, JP Morgan, this is a little bit of a twist on that, but he said years ago, you probably know this, that gold is money and everything else is credit. And boy, <laughs> there's so much credit out there right now, yeah, uh, questionable, yeah. questionable uh, you know, quality and, and durability. And, you know, you look at what's happening in the UK, which is, I, mean, I think we're going through a period here where these developed market governments, which would include the United States, but UK is really the, the one in focus right now, are starting to behave more like developing markets, where they're behaving, you know, taking on these characteristics of emerging market monetary and fiscal policy. And that, and I, I do think ultimately that kind of a scenario is going to be extremely bullish for precious metals. Uh, we're going to talk about precious metals now for just one minute with Sean uh, Reynolds, the customer service manager for Bullion Max. Are people calling you now, calling Bullion Max now, Sean, to uh, find out where gold is, where they, where you think it's going to go, or are they asking, you know, what should I buy? <laughs> they, they've just recognized that they, they need precious metals, regardless of how they learned that message, whether it's right-wing radio or listening to, you know, people who are plugged into our financial situation and understanding that, you know, you need some other form of currency if fiat currency ends up biting the dust. And many of these people are new to purchasing. Many of them are grandparents and they're looking out for their children, their grandchildren. So they're, they understand that this is not something you can flip. This is something you got to buy and hold if you're, you're going to have metals do what it tends to do uh, over time. And so um, they they just understand it's something they feel they need to do. Well, we thank you for that. Uh, our guest, our special guest today is David Hay, the author of Bubble 3.0. And David, as I Think of bubbles, I, you know, blowing bubbles as a kid. One of the fun parts was to pop them. Is this going to pop? It already has, Mark. I mean, this is the, the carnage that we're seeing is really quite extraordinary. You know, Dogecoin, for example, has gone from 88 billion down to 8 billion, which means it's still got another 8 billion to go to zero. But you've had tremendous devastation in what I was calling the crazy overpriced stocks, the cops. You know, profitless tech, the meme stocks, so many of these are down 70, 80, even 90 mm-hmm. percent. Uh, we've, we've actually, even if you look at a traditional 60, 40 balanced portfolio, it's had the worst start to a year in a century. And of course, the year is you know largely over at this point. So it's it's one for the record books. Uh, and you mentioned real estate starting to crack. And I think one of my biggest fears is a global real estate bear market. Because frankly, the housing bubble in other countries, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, some of the Nordic countries were, were far greater than the U.S. housing bubble, which is bad enough. I mean, new homes in America have almost doubled from where they were in 07 at the peak of supposedly the, the, you know, the housing bubble to end all housing bubbles. Mm-hmm. And it's worse, far worse overseas and, and or just across the Canadian border. So, I mean, that, if that if that bubble really does implode similar to what we saw back in 08, 09, you know, the implications for the global economy are quite dire. 
uh, real estate here in Southern California, um, up until say four months ago, uh, a house would be on uh, up for sale, and I'm going to make it very low, folks, a hundred thousand dollars, and people were offering a hundred and ten, hundred and fifteen, even a hundred and twenty thousand dollars over asking price. It, it was it was amazing. Mm -hmm. it, was it was insane. Like it was somebody, insane. It really was. It was mass insane. insanity. Yeah. Uh, so the, the question is, are we going to see this again or not for well, a while? Well, I just I have a tremendous faith in, the, in humanity to stoke the next bubble. Uh, it's amazing how short memories are. But for the time being, we're on de deflation mode. And I think it's a multi-stage deflation mode. And so far, the stock market is down about 20%. Which you know that's painful, but you know given all the things that are going wrong, and of course interest rates have absolutely skyrocketed, even though they're still negative in real terms, as you were kind of alluding to with inflation at eight to nine percent. But uh, those interest rates have gone up. You know, got a seven seven percent thirty year mortgage, so that's affordability already was terrible because of those bidding wars that you were referring to. But now with these higher rates, it's uh, you know affordability is you know really terrible, and so the prices are starting to really come down in real estate. But I think they're going to come down. At an accelerating rate going forward. Yeah, I would think the buyers are are going to have a lot more strength when they're when they're making their offers to get more things prepared to get more things included in that price because they're not facing the competition they once were when money was so cheap and you could just throw more money uh, in your offer. You know, now I think the pendulum might have swung a little bit in the other direction there for the buyers. Oh, absolutely! It is now a buyer's market. There's no question. I think it's going to become even more so. And and yet, rental prices are going up. Uh, uh, I just read a, a study uh, that uh, Oklahoma City, yep, or right the here. state of Oklahoma, is is the is the highest percentage in a year in terms of of rentals, uh, uh, rental cost. They've gone up. Um, I can't remember what I what what it was. It was it was almost thirty percent. Mm -hmm. In a year, nobody, I don't know anybody who could afford that, especially if you're renting, you should be buying. But uh, the good news is those rents are starting to come down in certain markets. And I think it is a little bit like housing, but if you look year over year, housing price increases are still quite strong. But if you look from the peak earlier this year, prices are actually down. So I, I think you are, and there's also been a tremendous boom of multifamily construction, more so than single family where right. you, can make, you can make a cogent argument, there's still a deficit of new homes needed relative to household formations. But in the multifamily area, to me, it looks like real trouble coming. But I think the area that's even worse is office, where you've you know, got something like a 40, 45% vacancy rate. And mm -hmm. a lot of these folks just aren't simply coming back to the office ever. What I don't understand is why people are building offices <laughs> because of just what you said. Uh, um, locally, uh, my wife and I passed some office buildings that a couple of months ago were in construction and they were half filled. We passed them the other day and they were, you know, half, maybe even three quarters filled. Don't people want to stay at home and work at work at home like Sean and I and maybe you do as well, Dave? Yes, I mostly work from home as well. Yes, you're right. No, I think that's a that's not just a COVID trend. I think that's with us. I think people really prefer you know, to even if they do go to the office, it's going to be a lot, a lot less frequent. And of course, for companies, it's a great way to save money. I mean, these these offices can be extremely pricey. Yeah, and when you consider, man, dispensaries were going in anywhere for a while there. I think there's even more space than dispensaries need in Oklahoma these days. You know, it used to be anything that became, you know, this used to be an Arby's, this used to be a whatever. Now it's a dispensary. This used to be a bookstore. Now it's a dispensary. I think even these offices are, are they've got more space available than the dispensaries can use. And, mm -hmm. and that really speaks volumes because it used to be up and down the streets. There was something in every building. There was there 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 was something going on everywhere. But lately, you're right. You just you just see more businesses closed or office office space that's not being used. That's just it's shocking to me. It's it, it you know it it just really strikes me when I drive down the street and I see no action, no action. Okay, there's something there, no action. 
fantastic change. Just amazing. Yeah, yeah. We, uh, we here in Southern California, I'm in Ventura County. There are strip malls and there'll be an anchor building, an anchor office that's uh, uh, that's gone out of business, uh, a company that's gone out of uh, business. Uh, by dispensaries, are you talking about uh, uh, CBD and uh, CBD? Yeah, medical marijuana, yeah. 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 Medical marijuana. Seems like they would pop up anywhere, just any new open space. And even, even that market has been saturated and, and doesn't need that much building space as the, as the office spaces have coughed up. Well, it's interesting because uh, uh, that, that's a, a program maybe we should do, Sean, because uh, dispensaries still have a problem with banking. They can't do it. They can't, they can't put the money in the bank and take credit cards and things like that. Yeah, same, same with health insurance. There are a bunch of places that don't want to insure those folks because of the nature of their business. Sure. Pretty amazing. Exactly. So, um, David, if the bubble is burst, what can individuals do to, you know, make bubble 4.0? Because we will. We we don't go back in history, as you know. We mm -hmm. we uh, we just re we just keep going forward. Doomed to repeat it. Yes. Right. Well, I think it's a great point, and I think that what we're likely to see is something similar to the first decade of this century slash millennium, millennium, where we had a. a a very rough stock market, you know, from 2000 to 2009, mm -hmm. and yet commodities, hard assets did quite well. We also saw that in the 1970s. And I think this decade actually is more analogous to the 1970s, but with some of the aspects of, of that first decade of the century in terms of another tremendous housing bubble. So I, I think that, you know, as we all know, most people are underweight commodities. And part of that is because they have tended to default to indexing. You know, we've seen the, the studies where the money slowed enormously into index vehicles and away from active management. And by definition, those index vehicles have almost zero commodity exposure, very little, mostly energy. And energy, even though it's done great over the last couple of years, is only four, four and a half, five percent of the S and P. Mm. And actually, just to put a little footnote in, is as bullish as I am on precious metals, I'm even more bullish on energy. I think oil and natural gas are. Uh, they're just they're extremely tight right now from an inventory standpoint. Right. Uh, the supply demand the dynamics are extremely favorable for higher prices. Uh, obviously, the Biden administration is flooding the market with oil. You know, the strategic petroleum reserve is down to the lowest level in almost 40 years. And if you adjust for how much more demand is, you know, like double where it was 40 years ago, mm -hmm. it's really shockingly low. So they're going to have to replenish. And right now, the oil is being kind of held down by demand destruction fears due to this pending recession. But the reality is, I mean, if we had a 2 million barrel a day drop in demand for oil, that would be stunning. And it looks like we're going to have a 4 to 5 million barrel a day increase between things like the SPR releases going away, reduction of some Russian output, what OPEC has done with their cut here recently, uh, Europe, which is doing fuel switching for the first time ever, where they're actually burning oil to produce electricity versus coal and natural gas, because coal and natural gas have gone up so much over there. So there's you know, about a five, five million barrel a day increase or decrease in supply that we're looking at. And I think natural gas is in the U.S. where you can buy it for five dollars uh, per million BTUs for next summer. That's really cheap. You know, it's like five dollars a gallon of gas where it's trading for four or five times that in Europe right now, even though the prices have come back. So it's but I just think in general, I mean, uranium looks attractive to us right now mm -hmm. uh, because there's going to be a nuclear renaissance that's almost unavoidable. 60 new nuclear mm -hmm. facilities under construction globally. I think copper, you know, because we're going to make this EV push for better or for worse, I think it's for worse, but the demand for copper is going to go up you know, exponentially. Silver yeah. as well. Yes, and silver has got strong demand uh, because of the solar panels. And so it's, I think it's a wonderful time to be overweight commodities, but very few people are. And of course, whenever they have these sell-offs, and a lot of that lately has been related to the wrecking ball dollar that we talked about and the recession fears. But both of those are going to fade at some point, and commodities will have another major uplink, in my view. I know that uh, you said that uh, you, you're you taking our, our time now and making it, uh, it's akin to the 70s, as long as disco does not come back. <laughs> Well, you never know. I think you no bottoms know. are. You know. <laughs> um, as we wrap up our time together this time, 
one, I'd like to invite you to come back in maybe a couple of months and, and take a look at what's happening with precious metals um, and, and, and energy and the, the overall economy, which I haven't asked. Is the economy still robust or is it slowing down? I think it's losing altitude quite rapidly. Uh, inflation's kind of sticky, and it's, of course it's stickier with services, but you're, you're seeing a lot of deflation and certainly the commodity complexes we talked about, but now as you mentioned real estate, it's huge. And real estate deflation has much more of a negative impact than stock prices because that's, for the most people, the, where their you know, main net worth is. So I think there's very little doubt that we're going to have a recession where it looks like we're already beginning an earnings recession. Mm -hmm. But I think an actual recession that's going to lead to surprisingly higher unemployment fairly quickly is going to catch people by surprise. There's this view that the labor market is extremely tight, which it has been, but it's changing you know, quite drastically and quickly. And by tight, it, uh, we, we've had the lowest unemployment for years now, uh, or at least for the last year and a half, two years. And you think that... Uh, We'll be back at the unemployment line. Well, hopefully not the three of us. Yes. <laughs> but unfortunately, I think uh, some of our fellow citizens will be. I think the unemployment rate's headed back up to 5% here relatively quickly. And you've probably seen the stats that it's kind of surprising how sensitive the economy is to higher unemployment, but only about a half a percent increase in unemployment. So from three and a half to four, you know, that's a, like a guaranteed you're going to get a recession. The other thing is if you look at the leading indicators, uh, they've had six down months in a row. I mean, there's two different ways to look at it, but on one at six, on the other one at six out of seven months, that's just 100% odds of a recession. And you look at the yield curve, which is highly inverted. That's another great recession warning. And I mean, the evidence is just rapidly piling up that we are. And I didn't think this, by the way, early in the year. Early in the year, I thought we were going to have an inflationary boom, and we certainly have had lots of inflation. But you know, things have changed, and you know, you just when the facts change, you better change your mind. Well, the. Um... The bubble has burst, or has it? Uh, the way for you to find out is by picking up a copy of Bubble 3.0. Uh, Sean, thank you for joining us. Very quickly, what are people asking about at Bullion Max right now? People are wondering what types of things they should be buying. And I usually answer that with a question. I don't mean to be rude when I do so. But it helps me to understand what their goals are. So I can point them in, in the direction of products that may be something that will help them out. And my last uh, thought to you, uh, uh, David, is do you have uh, precious metals in your portfolio? Absolutely. Especially have a lot of the miners, which tend to be precious metals on steroids. Uh, and they, of course, have been whacked hard here lately. Early in the year, they were actually doing quite well. We took some profits at that point, too, but they're, they're down now. So, you know, if the people do want to track, you know, our recommendations, because we do a Making Hay Monday, so one's going out today, where we really have specific uh, trade recommendations. And uh, they can get that by going to Substack and Googling that or putting in the Haymaker on Substack. We and that's a free service. It's free, by the way. Everybody's favorite product. That's, uh, that's good. What we're going to do is we'll have, we have had up throughout our uh, our time together, uh, your, uh, your website and... Um, uh, so people can find out more about the book, more about Thank the you. podcast as well. David, look forward to our next conversation. Sean, I look forward to our next conversation. And yes, we sir. always look forward to hearing from you as well. Thank you for watching. This is Bullion Max, the podcast. I'm Mark Allen. We'll see you next time. And Thank don't you, forget to subscribe. I always forget that. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I'm Thank here, you. Mark. I'm here to remind you to tell everybody. Subscribe to the Bull and Max podcast.